would like to welcome you and to introduce you to our uh, panelists and to uh, the um, audience. So, uh, in a, a few words, uh, Dr. German Ragozin uh, is a senior lecturer at uh, in the World History Department, uh, the Higher School of Social Sciences, Humanities, and International Communication at the Northern Arctic Federal University named after Lomonosov in the Federation of Russia, in the Russian Federation, sorry. So uh, Mr. Uh, Ragozin is uh, calling you, speaking from far in the north, and uh, I'm very happy that we have this geographical extent here in our conference. Uh, a bit about your uh, research interest. First, maybe your dissertation topic was about the Austro-Prussian dualism in Germany between 1763 and 1866 from an ideological perspective, the yeah, ideological aspect of this dualism. Uh, and uh, in general, your research interests uh, concern uh, modern and contemporary history of Germany and Austria, intellectual history of Prussia and Austria between uh, 1701 and 1871, so uh, through the 18th and, and most part of the 19th century. Uh, also, mm, transformation of German and Austrian identities. Later in the chronology, the Prussian heritage issue in the GDR, which is the German Democratic Republic, so after 49, in 49 and 90, um, as well as the historical policies of the German Democratic Republic. Um, if you agree, I would uh, like to give the opportunity to start with your presentation. So uh, you have, as I told, uh, the 20 to 30 minutes, feel comfortable about time. Just make sure that uh, half an hour would be more or less the maximum so that we will uh, be able to discuss uh, the topic uh, afterwards, but no stress, okay? So uh, I switch off my camera and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear organizers, thank you very much for organizing the event and inviting me to participate in the conference. I'm pleased to speak, even despite, even despite the fact that I'm pretty far from the Baltic region. Well, okay, not that far. One and a half hours uh, flight to St. Petersburg, <laughs> and I'm already in the Baltic region, formally. Yes, I will switch to demonstration of the presentation. Yes. Uh, does it all work? Yes. So it works, it works. Thank you. Thank you, dear Dr. Weber. Yes, now I will start. Uh, my topic uh, for um, uh, for the conference uh, was chosen as Russian heritage policy in uh, Soviet occupation zone or GDR and East Prussia Kaliningrad region. Uh, the chosen period is 1945 to 1968, uh, touching upon the aspects of cultural bordering, Sovietization and uh, historical memory. As you have already underlined that fact uh, that it's not, it was not my major research topic, but uh, during my uh, studies, uh, during my PhD, I um, uh, had an experience uh, to prepare several uh, works devoted to uh, GDR historical policy. Uh, so more or less, I have received uh, some kind of a second um, uh, research uh, interest, which is uh, still developing, and uh, I have several papers published. I can also share uh, them with you. Um, they are in uh, Russian, but if uh, the but if you are interested, I could uh, present some key moments from them as well. Uh, so I will I I should underline first that the cultural boarding appears to return to the agenda even despite the integration processes in the EU and beyond. Of course, the category of um, national and geopolitical interests is uh, also coming back is also on the agenda as well in both Russia and the EU in the Baltic Sea area. 
uh, also uh, enforced with the exclave status of Kaliningrad region after 1991 due to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, revisiting the historical memory also takes place on both sides of the boundary. Uh, on both uh, national, on, on national, supranational, and local levels, and of course, these processes cause alarmism in both in regional authorities and in Moscow. The border fear of Germanization in Kaliningrad is uh, can still be heard and even broadcasted in the federal media. Uh, uh, so. Um, at the same time, the reunification of Germany posed similar question, but on historical memory, uh, historical policy and official branding strategy for uh, new federal lands. Uh, so in both areas, revising the Prussian heritage took place uh, and uh, related historical, and of course the historical memory was, uh, was on the agenda on both sides of the boundary. Uh, of course, desovietization and um, uh, reshaping the political landscapes raised the issue of the historical image in both Berlin, Brandenburg, and Kaliningrad as two regions which used to be the core of the former Kingdom of Prussia. Of course, according to 2 plus 4 treaty, or treaty on, uh, of uh, 1990 on the uh, final uh, regulation uh, in, in Germany, uh, the issue of handing over the uh, territories east from the organized NICE line so, uh, was uh, no longer to appear on a discussion alongside with changing the borders. On the other hand, uh, the discussions on cultural identity started to uh, emerge uh, and continue upon today. Uh, some kind of my personal experience um, uh, during my trips to Germany prior to 2017, uh, I appeared to be a witness to uh, reconstruct Berlin. Uh, so this was also some kind of personal impact to start to, to revisit this topic one more time. Of course, turbulent situation in 1990s Russia made an impact on intercepting the foreign strategy, especially on the Baltic area, and the image of so-called Germanization started to appear. Uh, so some kind of, so a border fear uh, that the region could be uh, lost, uh, uh, could be lost from Russia, and uh, uh, of course shaping the historical memory towards the specific region uh, started. Uh, especially towards the period before 1945. Of course, it was a set of uh, cultural, ethnopolitical, and commemorative issues. Uh, after 1945, this uh, problem was under uh, control from the Communist Party and the Soviet government. Uh, when uh, the uh, German population was uh, uh, expelled, uh, started to be expelled in 1945 from the former East Prussia, uh, the new cultural border started to emerge. Initially, there was no persistent strategy towards the region. Uh, here, the, bo here uh, the border fear of, uh, of 1945 was, uh, uh, up to 1945, was to tap into a Cold War strategy. So this was the part of the military planning and uh, the Kaliningrad region was, uh, the region was the area of the significant military presence. Uh, in uh, so as uh, in the part of the strategic planning against uh, la later against NATO, and the Prussian heritage topic was a subject to an unofficial taboo. Uh, also, it was the part of the pre of the political discourse existing in the previous period, since uh, for Soviet government the cliches of Prussian militarism, Prussian reactionism were quite common in propaganda, in military pedagogy in uh, historical memory uh, emerged you know, according to the Communist Party's policy. So introdu and introducing the Soviet culture had a higher priority for Moscow and new regional authorities. Uh, the Prussian heritage in contemporary Germany is also subject to, to active reflections and discussion. Of course, when the of course, uh, uh, abolition of the Prussian state 
uh, was justification was uh, just, uh, was justified with the acts of uh, constant military aggression of uh, the state. If we take a look into uh, law number forty six from the Allied Control Council. Uh, afterwards, uh, when the SED regime emerged in East Germany, um, of course, being under Soviet impact, under Soviet uh, control, uh, the, of course, it was, uh, uh, of course, it also had uh, impact on the heritage policy. The negativist phase started and lasted until the emergence of Eric Honecker as the head of the SED and GDR. Uh, and the practical steps included the uh, demolition of uh, monuments, uh, prohibition of the intellectual heritage, and uh, active propagandist campaigns with criticism. The formal reasons stated in, Polit in uh, Politburo of the SED Central Committee were, to, uh, for example, to establish the image of the people's uh, city uh, so this demonstrating the social uh, the social supremacy of the uh, socialism in uh, East Germany uh, the second was the cliche of the victory of a Potsdam spirit uh, so uh, freeing the new, Ger the new German state of uh, the new German state from the militarist and aggressive patterns of course, uh, it led to criticism to Russian heritage, which lasted until late 1960s. Um, uh, the changes started during the during Honecker's um, uh, uh, during the Honecker's chairmanship in the uh, SED and in uh, the State Council. Um, and, uh, it, uh, of course, was to justify the uh, more independent course of the GDR in the uh, Soviet bloc and in the German problem. Some kind of, it was also some kind of the informal competition between Bonn and East Berlin uh, in uh, presenting its, in presenting it, in presenting themselves as the, the successors of the national state. Uh, so, uh, uh, and after the reunification of Germany, the Prussian heritage gained a controversial status. The part of the historical memory, part of the regional branding in uh, Berlin Brandenburg, uh, of course, covering the identity gap after 1990, but on the other hand, the uh, part of the rework reworking of the on the past, uh, revisiting and uh, rethinking uh, the elements of the historical memory. As I have mentioned in, so in the Soviet historiography, this topic was when the some kind of an informal, an informal taboo. Uh, since the topic used to be monopolized um, according uh, within propaganda and uh, within ideology. Uh, for nowadays, this topic, the Sovietization of East Russia is uh, uh, one of the main research fields for Baltic Federal University named after Immanuel Kant in Kaliningrad. Uh, the Department of History works with various issues, for example, the daily life of the Soviet village in the region, uh, East Prussia with the eyes of the first Soviet settlers. Uh, I also wanted to include some photos from my personal archive, but uh, I suppose it could be also uh, done afterwards. Um, and. Uh, on the other hand, in, in Germany, dealing with the revisiting the Prussian heritage, heritage um, in, in GDR is um, also one of the uh, one of the research fields, and of course, um, it uh, and of course it was to uh, revisit the of course it was to rethink the strategy of the gd of, of the commun of the sad social socialism unity socialist unity party and to uh to understand how did this uh, vector of the ideology change and uh, why uh of course the issue was quite painful for both sides for both gdr and for the soviet union 
Uh, of course, uh, for uh, German side, it was problematic to refer to Prussian heritage since um, the ideological capital, so the place where the Prussian king, uh, kings and German emperors were to be crowned, was handed over to another state. Uh, also, um, uh, also one of the leading approaches is that the SED tried to uh, erase the uh, Ger the Prussian element from the now German national identity within the Republic, within the GDR, uh, before 1968. Uh, so such kind of a failed search for national identity started to, uh, according to Dietrich Orlov, uh, was um, uh, went first to the negativist phase. Uh, of course, it was the. Uh, of course, it is also some kind of the. Um, in an inconvenient past, uh, according to the concept implemented uh, by Nikolai Epler in Russia. So the Prussian topic was some kind of that. Uh, of course, uh, the non-official thesis could be similar to Polish one uh, in the Soviet uh, in the Soviet state. The former East Prussia had an image of the territory with an uncertain future. And uh, the border fear also was uh, accompanied uh, with um, uh, propagandist campaigns. So, for example, if you take a look into the central communist party media, like Pravda newspaper, you can take uh, you in 1960s, you can easily find the notes and uh, publications stating that the uh, 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 that the uh, that the <coughs> Uh, Christian Democratic Union uh, uses um, uh, uses the Prussian heritage as uh, the um, as the means of reclaiming the lost territories. Of course, that the, even the Chancellor Adenauer used to used to personally used to attend the uh, federated meetings of the federations of the ex in in West Germany, and uh, stating that the people from the territories east of Odenice line were uh, the, were the active and uh, proficient participants of the founding of the German state uh, earlier. What actually remains uh, uh, un what actually remains uh, underexplored is that the connection of the Soviet frontier uh, in former East Prussia, Kaliningrad, and the um, Prussian heritage demolition and Soviet occupation zone in GDR. Uh, these uh, policies have same, the same nature and are the part of the um, of constructing the new identities. Uh, and the purpose of this paper is to give an assessment to Russian heritage uh, and the uh, Kaliningrad region of the USSR between uh, 1945 and 1968 within the Sovietization, border fear, and historical policy of the communist regimes. Mm. Of course, I should first say that the um, negativism towards Russian communist ideology was was not the new trend. It was quite common even before the communist regime emerged in uh, Russia, then Soviet Union. Uh, criticism against uh, Prussian reactionism, Prussian absolutism, uh, Prussian militarism was quite common and uh, was not in view for Soviet government was implemented from the works of Karl Marx and uh, Franz Mehring. Uh, these uh, cliches uh, started to dominate in the public discourse, in, for example, in military pedagogy, in, his, in the historical research. And uh, of course, uh, it was quite, uh, and of course, it was widely broadcast for the communist parties in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and according to the communist ideologists, uh, the National Socialism uh, was uh, an obvious successor of the Prussian militarism and reaction. Uh, this uh, myth used to, uh, uh, used to went through the Soviet propaganda during the World War II, especially the one during the uh, Soviet German, or uh, how do we call it in Russia, Great Patriotic War. Um, of course, uh, the abolition of the Prussian state had uh, just found a justification for Soviet Union as well. 
and uh, that negative uh, attitude towards Russian heritage was um, dominating. And the vast number of the propagandist papers, for example, by Alexander Molov in uh, German military crimes in Europe uh, in tenth, uh, from 10th to 20th centuries, yes, there was a work published under this name uh, in Russian. And uh, such trend was quite common in the academia during this period of time, in Soviet academia during this period of time. Elimination of Russia's political entity had was uh, seemed to be just uh, and uh, clear, and um, um, the, according to the position of the ideologists and military, where it was, um, it was uh, acceptable strategy. Of course, new bordering in the Baltic Sea area was the starting point, point to erase the Russian heritage from the political discourse. For example, in uh, former uh, East Russia, then Königsberg uh, region, then Kaliningrad region. Um, uh, and of course, uh, it was um, uh, first to, Soviet, uh, to hold the Sovietization. Uh, most part of the German population fled in, in, the early, in late 1944, early 1945. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, around 100,000 Germans remained in the area. And the German population also was to be involved in the Sovietization. Uh, such uh, printed media as the Neue Zeit newspaper printed in the Kaliningrad region uh, for between, nine, uh, between June 1947 to October 1948 was to upkeep first the relic identity and second to, to let the Germans uh, living there understand that they are also uh, a part of the Soviet policy here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, such uh, scholars in Russia like Do you read me? Hello? We can hear you, we can hear you. Oh, good, thank you. Uh, I will continue. Uh, contemporary Russian scholars like uh, Yuri Kostashov in Baltic Federal University state that Kalinin, early Kaliningrad region was the place uh, with two parallel roads, roads living in the same area. So uh, the Konigsberg Oblast of the Russian uh, Federation, um, then Kaliningrad region, uh, has received another name, and so did all the cities, uh, places, and geographical objects. Uh, so that the, the Germanization and Germanization started to take place. Uh, the parallel play of process was Sovietization of the German community. For example, if you take a look into Neue Zeit newspaper, it uh, broadcasted the repatriation of German community uh, and the purpose was to demonstrate the Soviet assistance and to criticize the Western allies for their policy in Germany. Uh, the Neue Zeit did not make any special emphasis on the Prussian heritage, with some exceptions. For uh, of course, it was to demonstrate the victory of the Soviet uh, Union as the logical continue, continue, continuity towards the uh, Russian victory over Prussian weapon in Seven Years' War. Uh, this uh, can be traced in a note devoted to uh, opening the obelisk devoted to Russian victory in, uh, in 1757. Another variant was uh, to reshape the monument. It was also stated in a newspaper. Uh, for example, um, uh, if we take a look into notes devoted to uh, Preuss Shailau battle in 1807. The, monuments, uh, the monument uh, set in Bagrationovsk was, or Preuss Shailau, was renamed as a monument devoted to glory of the Russian weapon. It avoided demolition because of the port portrait of uh, General Benningsen, on, which was on Russian service. Uh, of course, crit criticism towards former statehood uh, took place when the statements of the Soviet leaders were reprinted in the Neue Zeit in German translation. Uh, the German uh, military was called monarchist, so presenting it as a successor of the National Socialists. 
so, uh, the so, uh, so these publications would demonstrate the Soviet negativism. Uh, of course, uh, removing the Prussian heritage uh, uh, continued in various forms. You can see them there. For example, uh, former castles were, or churches uh, were uh, were used in other in other purposes. For example, educational institutions, theaters, uh, uh, concert halls, military objects, penitentiary camps, and so on. Of course, um, uh, the disassembling the uh, uh, houses took place in central areas, so in Alch former Altstadt and uh, Kreikhof and um, uh, Vorstadt, uh, Vorstadt areas, in order to provide the restoration works in Leningrad with the brick. The final step in uh, Kaliningrad was the uh, uh, was in 1968 when the regional communist party authorities uh, demolished the ruins of the former royal castle uh, of, uh, actually this act caused a harsh discussion in kaliningrad uh, there was uh, um, there was even a protest uh, in order to preserve this uh, dominant even despite these were the ruins uh, as uh, some part of the heritage for the region on the other hand the uh, media of the communist party say, stated that the rotten tooth and the fascist castle is to be removed uh, we're also presenting the new project uh, the new architectural dominance for the uh, for kaliningrad called dom sovietov which was which appeared as an approved project in 1968 uh, we can trace the similar process of uh, in the um, uh, the similar process in the um, uh, GDR, as it was stated previously on the slide. First, the propagandist campaigns uh, in the SED newspaper, Neues Deutschland, uh, emphasizing the nature of the Prussian state as the core of the reaction. Uh, so, excluding the Prussian heritage from political discourse was an official, was an official policy in uh, Soviet occupation zone later GDR, then in Kaliningrad as well. Then the deborosification started as a consequent policy of the asset there in East Germany. So demolishing the uh, castles in Berlin and Potsdam, demolishing the garnison Kirche in Potsdam as well, uh, and then revisiting these places uh, into the uh, forums, uh, into the new part of the of the social socialist capital city, free from castle history. Uh, published in both central medias like Neues Deutschland and in both local and regional like Mackische Volksstimme. Uh, so, the four, so then, but then it was to be revisited again during the Hanukkah's reign. And for example, the Palace of the Republic and so the building of the State Council were to integrate the former elements of the Prussian heritage. But this was uh, as a revisiting of the status of the GDR, according to Honig as well. Of course, uh, mm, uh, mm, of course, uh, removing the Russian heritage being the common trend and uh, uh, being the part of the common debarusification in both areas was uh, under the same ideological monitoring was under the uh sim was under the similar vector but on the other hand the soviet authorities did not have persistent strategy uh, there were only several campaigns um, as we can see in the soviet occupation zone in gdr it used to be a consequent strategy discussed in the police bureau and in the central committee of the sad uh Replacing uh, how to how was it decided to replace? First, uh, I have told you that it was to uh, present the new urban space, and the second to present the new uh, present the supremacy of the new ideology and its political practice. Of course, Prussian militarism used to be a common cliche to demonize the West German government, its NATO membership, and its political system. So. There was a similar border thing, even in the USSR and GDR, connected to the Prussian heritage for the first time. 
only then it started to disappear uh, also with the revision of the USSR GDR relations and uh, so and USSR Fed West Germany relations. So this topic appeared to be suppressed and uh, put to the background. Until 1970s, so it was a common practice to uh, remove to use the negative image uh, of Russian heritage in politics, pedagogy, and uh, uh, in propaganda. But the main difference was uh, with attracting the, acad the academia to demonize the Prussian heritage. In the USSR, the Prussian history was a monopolized topic for central institutions. And as for Soviet regime, it was also monopolized according to, ideolo uh, to ideological reasons. In the GDR, uh, historians were involved in the regular propagandist anti Prussian campaigns, but with several exceptions. For example, the Federation robbery philosophy by Zerubov Gucci neighbors with the uh, memorial evenings devoted to General Shanko and to other military reformers in the early 19th century Prussia. Uh, the second major exception was the military uniform and ceremonial. And the turning point in both regions was 1968 uh, when the Prussian discourse started to return to the agenda in GDR. Or so the anti prussian propagandist campaigns in the Soviet Union started to decline and to disappear. Uh, on the other hand, the image of the GDR of more national German states started to appear on the foreground and to be presented. And uh, I will skip several foreign, uh, several urban legends in Kaliningrad, and one of them was devoted to preserving the ruins of the former Königsberg Cathedral, and it was connected with the rape of Emmanuel Kant. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, that and of course, the GDR policy faced a number of um, obstacles uh, in order to upkeep this policy, because the fear was uh, uh, to put all the history of, the, uh, of Germany into the traumatic past, which was unacceptable. Uh, on the other hand, for Soviets, their traumatic memory was um, connected predominantly with the war World War II and the image of the National Socialism as the success of the Prussian tradition. Uh, it was more connected with the recent warfare experience. So the GDF policy appeared to evolve into revisiting the Prussian heritage. And then the border fear transformed into a justification of the independent foreign policy of the Republic, into destalinization and a new turn in discussion of the German problem in Europe. Uh, of course, it lost its main function to, of course, the anti Prussian discourse uh, existed in several parts, but it lost its main function to justify the new reshaping of the urban space and the political system. Um, of course, the former East Prussian East Prussia was the figure under the silence. So it was no longer to be raised in the GDR. It was um, it was a fear to provoke the Soviet Union for more decisive action. So the border plea in the USSR was uh, the main reason to implement the, the debarusification strategy. Uh, so also, finally, ending into the into putting the any foreign presence in Kaliningrad to a possible minimum in the, with the security purposes. Uh, so the Prussian heritage, uh, uh, there was a fear that the Prussian heritage could be considered as a possible justification to hostile actions against Soviet uh, presence in the region and, and against the Soviet state as well. So enforcing the anti-Prussian myth and Soviet ideology supported this, both the fear, but for, but for Moscow. Uh, uh, as for GDR, uh, by 1968, the, idea, the ideological and national identity crisis was a fact because of the, uh, because of the Prussian problem. And uh, it, was, uh, it was here for the Central Committee and for Politburo to revise the identity strategy and revise the historical policy, historical memory. Uh, of course, uh, where the Prussian heritage was to be one of the four parts. So in both cases, the similarity was the political image 
and cultural heritage preservation with, within similar political systems and similar identity construction attempts, which could which um, ended unsuccessfully. But the main difference was in historical memory approach, even existing until nowadays, on the case of the certain region with disputed or or so some kind of an inconvenient past. Thank you all for your attention, and I will be pleased to answer your questions. Yes. Pierre, please unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Ragozin, for your topic, for your presentation. Thank you for your time, discipline, even if it's not the most important. And the most important is, of course, what you have. Uh, told us uh, and, and the way you compared also the two two different uh, and sometimes also similar approaches to the Prussian uh, heritage from a different perspective, of course, because the DR's perspective was an, an, an internal one in some way, a German one, whereas the, the Russian or the, the Soviet one, let's say, was, was an external one. Uh, I see that uh, there are already uh, questions or comments from uh, the panelists, so I uh, just uh, give the priority to the other ones. If I, there is some time for me, I will add my comments, or we keep that in the summing up uh, tomorrow uh, morning or tomorrow noon. Uh, I'm not sure who was uh, first, so uh, I would go through the alphabetic uh, uh, order. So, uh, Mr. Ciprian, me too, you are the first one. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, actually, my, my question is outside the time span of your presentation. I was uh, just wondering if today there are some um, museums, uh, memorials in the Kaliningrad region that could um, shed some light on the German history of the, of the region if you know about such museums or memorials existing today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Nitsu. Uh, of course, uh, of course, in present day Kaliningrad region, the former Prussian and uh, then German heritage is a part of the local discourse and local and uh, partly the local branding where it is see where it appears to be possible for example even in kaliningrad itself you can uh the former Königsberger dome is reconstructed and turned into the museum as well museum of Königsberg museum also a concert hall with or with an or uh, with a uh also a concert hall uh there are also major museums for example Altes House uh, depicting the daily life of the uh, of the German merchants family of the early nine early twentieth century. Of course, there are uh, local museums devoted to the uh, devoted to the you know, devoted to the archaeological and uh, military history uh, de dealing also with the Prussian heritage. For example, the local museums uh, in Soviet formative zip. Uh, the museums uh, in uh, various small cities of the Kaliningrad region. Of course, they exist, and they started to emerge predominantly in the uh, 1990s. So they seem to be very young, but uh, on the other hand, they uh, started to refer to this um, disputed past of the region, all since their ideological vector started to change in late 1980s. So the topic appeared to return, uh, to return to the discourse, to appear in it where it is possible. Of course, uh, there are discussions to reconstruct some major uh, architectural dominance. So there was even a discussion to start the, the restoration works of the former royal castle, but it did, but it did not start actually. Uh, on the other hand, the reconstruction of some smaller spots takes place regularly. 
so that neglect towards Soviet, so that neglect towards Russian uh, heritage, which used to be in Soviet view, it started to be over, started to uh, be uh, started to was revised, and uh, and the changes took place. Thank you. Thank you very much. So going ahead. Uh, mm, Alphabetically, it would be uh, Dr. Akansha Singh. So please, uh, you can switch on your camera and your, your microphone to ask mm -hmm. questions. Dr. Ragozin, it's your turn. Okay, uh, thank you so much for a very interesting and informative lecture or presentation. I was just wondering, because you mentioned cultural uh, identity politics in your presentation, right? You spoke about uh, it in the <clears throat> beginning of your uh, lecture, and uh, it is mentioned in your one of your slide also. So I was just thinking, if you could throw some more light on this particular concept uh, regarding the Baltic states, regarding the Russian minority, Russian-speaking population, because uh, I see and I've read about uh, how these people are being, you know, kind of. Uh, facing the mistress they they become uh, the cause of mistress between the uh, host society the nationalist countries the baltic states and the russia do you uh, kind of can you draw some parallel uh, using the same concept and uh, when i talk about mistress it is not about the government and uh, the people i'm talking about the majority population and the russian speaking po uh, population in these countries Thank you so much. I hope it, I was kind of clear <laughs> in asking me a question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Akanksha, for your uh, question. Uh, if we try to compare the situation with the uh, Kaliningrad and uh, the, the, the younger Baltic states like uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, uh, there, uh, we can uh, compare and it's very problematic to compare them uh, when it comes to uh, to a former when it comes to um, minorities to to the to the ethnic groups which appeared to be minorities after political after geopolitical shifts. Uh, uh, it's very difficult very difficult topic, but one similar thing can be traced. Uh, the post uh, the post imperial rea reality for the for the uh, for the former dominating ethnic groups uh, started. So they, of course, they lost their influence. They are, some of them even lost their possessions. Some of them could, uh, some of them could be even forced to emigrate. Uh, so some similar, some similarities can be there. So it's kind of uh, establishing the new, the new border area, establishing the new identity uh, and uh, of course, there can be some parallel, but only in some aspects in the cultural status of the ethnic of the certain ethnic group, in social, political, economic spheres. As for ideology, as for as for nationalism, uh, of course, uh, as for nationalism, of course, the younger Baltic states were under this impact. Of course, uh, even under some kind of the ethnocratic impact, impact uh, since the minority groups were to be excluded from the political process. Uh, but the difference uh, is uh, that, um, no, but of course, the difference is that, uh, um, uh, is, but, the but, the but of course, the difference is that the, there is no course, for example, in uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania to uh, push the Russian minority totally away. Of course, they do not state that officially. It's um, it's good for it. Often it can it is very dangerous for, for all these states uh, to discreditate themselves. So uh, such parallels should be done, of course, carefully and. Um, Taking all the all the details into consideration. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. You did. You did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Uh, and the third question or comment 
is by uh, Dr. Tomasz Szlepowronski of the Institute of History at the University of Szczecin. Uh, Tomasz, poproszę. Dziękuję bardzo. Państwo wybaczcie, że będę mówić w języku polskim, ale język Szekspira nie jest moją mocną starą, dlatego pozwólcie Państwo, że będę mówić po polsku. Rozumiem, że musicie Państwo przyłączyć się na język. Mam Bardzo dziękuję za bardzo ciekawe wystąpienie. To jest bardzo interesujące. Jest to zbieżne z moimi zainteresowaniem, także cieszę się że mogłem Pana poznać. Mam nadzieję, że, że, że może z tego się urodzi też coś, jakaś bliższa współpraca, bo moje zainteresowania są bardzo, bardzo podobne. Dlatego dwa pytania mam, dwie kwestie. Pierwsza kwestia dotyczy tego, co działo się w kaliningradzkiej obłaski, czyli, czyli w obwodzie kaliningradzkim. W Polsce też w ramach polonizacji ziem północnych i zachodnich od Niemczania następowało zjawisko zacierania tego polskiego dziedzictwa. Z tym, że my mieliśmy łatwiej, bo my mogliśmy odwołać się do słowiańskiej przeszłości regionu, do tego, że te ziemie były kiedyś właśnie słowiańskie, przejściowo miejscami były polskie. Interesuje mnie, jak to wyglądało w Związku Radzieckim. Czy temu zacieraniu dziedzictwa polskiego towarzyszyło właśnie coś, co by pozwalało znaleźć jakieś inne odwołania historyczne? Czy to zacieranie polegało tylko i wyłącznie na antyfaszyzmie i na budowaniu, nie wiem, ideologii marksistowskiej? Czy poszukiwano jakichś elementów tożsamościowych odwołujących się do przeszłości niepolskiej, niepolskiej w sensie nie państwa polskiego, a do przeszłości związanej z plemionami na przykład Prusów, czy może jakimiś kiedyś polskimi konotacjami związanego, związanymi z Królewcem. Czy też zupełnie to nie było istotne i pojawiała się no, swoista pewnego rodzaju pustka, pustka tożsamościowa dla nowych mieszkańców Kaliningradu. To jest pierwsza kwestia. I druga, Pana wystąpienie kończyło się na roku 1968. Natomiast ja bym chciał pójść kawałek dalej i y, chociaż chwilę porozmawiać o fascynującym okresie późniejszym związanym właśnie z dziedzictwem polskim, kiedy w NRD, trochę na wzór tego, co działo się w rfn mamy do czynienia z tak zwaną polską falą, czyli polski się wele. Ja myślę, że jest to związane z fiaskiem pewnej koncepcji y, y, zapoczątkowanej przez Ulbrichta, a potem kontynuowanej przez Honeckera, koncepcji budowy tak zwanego socjalistycznego narodu NRD. To całkowita wydmuszka, to pustka, to, 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 to oczywiście nie miało większego sensu. I dlatego poszukiwanie tych pozytywnych elementów dziedzictwa polskiego. Rok 79. mamy pracę Ingrid Mitzenzweig na temat Frederika II, Frederika Wielkiego. Potem, prawda, Engelberg pisze kapitalną pracę o Bismarcku. Honecker jest zachwycony, prawda, tym, co napisała Mitzenzweig. A pewnym szczytem tej polskiej fali w NRD jest powrót pomnika Frederika II na Unterder Linden w Berlinie. Mam pytanie, jak na to patrzyła historiografia Związku Radzieckiego, bo polska historiografia była bardzo krytyczna. Wtedy się pojawiło takie określenie popularne, że NRD to są tak zwane czerwone Prusy, Rote Proizen. Czy i polska historiografia, nawet ta historiografia, która podlegała ograniczeniom cenzuralnym w Polskiej Rzeczpospolitej Ludowej, no, pisała o tym dość krytycznie, stawiała na tym taki duży znak zapytania. Pojawiał się pewien strach, co ci enerdowcy wymyślali z dziedzictwem polskim. Czy podobna rzecz miała miejsce w Związku Radzieckim? Czy w Związku Radzieckim także e, historycy radzieccy patrzyli krytycznie na to, co dzieje się z, właśnie z dziedzictwem polskim w NRD, w latach 70. i 80. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stepowronski, for your questions. I am uh, pleased that uh, my presentation has received such a, such a deep feedback and uh, even uh, uh, provoking to continue this uh, research work further. Uh, if we take a look on what happened on Kal in Kaliningrad uh, Oblast, and uh, if we try to compare it with uh, with Poland, uh, of course there were several justifications connected with uh, the pre-Prussian, the pre-Teutonic, uh, the pre-Prussian state period. 
uh, connected with the Prussian tribes, since they used to be rela related to the Lithuanians and Latvians. Uh, of course, it was uh, of course it was a trend to state that all the Baltic tribes used to fight against the German expansion. So it was some kind of uh, an attempt to make some kind of a common past for both uh, Baltic ethnic, ethnic, ethnic groups and for the Russians. Uh, and of course, the question appears to be <laughs> uh, started a little bit, started deeper since I did not touch it, uh, touch it with a special emphasis. Uh, and uh, for example, if we take a look on the statements uh, during the negotiations in early 1945, the references to Slavic past of the former East Russia were made during the Yalta and Potsdam conferences. And uh, it was one of the reasons to justify the handing over the East, former East, some part of former East Russia to the Soviet state. As for the second question on the reflection on uh, reflections on the Prussian heritage in uh, GDR and West Germany after 1968, uh, of course, uh, such kind of a Prussian wave was a fact. Uh, and of course, uh, of course, uh, it was some kind of a part of the of the Honecker's discourses of Honecker's uh, attempts to show its more independent political course within the socialist community and uh, within uh, the German problem. Even stating that, uh, even sometimes stating that, uh, who knows who will be the leader of the German reunification. Of course, Honecker tried to state that he was to be such kind of the reunifier, some kind of uh, successor towards both Bismarck some kind of success, successor towards Frederick II. On the other hand, the Republic did not have such kind of resources. Uh, for, of course, the nation, the National People's Army was uh, um, even smaller than the Soviet group of troops in, Ger in Germany. So almost 100,000 uh, soldiers and officers again uh, could not be compared with uh, one of the strongest uh, military groups of the Soviet Army in both equipment and training. Uh, of course, uh, the Soviet history, the Soviet ideologists uh, uh, tried to uh, tried to pay as, as uh, less attention as it could be possible to the Prussian topic. On the other hand, the researchers uh, started to uh, get into the Prussian issue, Prussian history issues more attentively and more cautiously. Uh, because it was also some kind of a censorship, as it could, as it was in, as a, could be similar to a Polish one, and um, of course uh, it was a strict criticism in the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union towards Honecker, since um, um, even uh, even the ideologists, even the even Brezhnev, even the military command stated that. What is GDR without the Soviet assistance? What is GDR without the Soviet military presence? What is GDR without the Soviets? It's nothing. So it could be easily taken by the West by West Germany. Uh, of course, the uh, of course, if we take a look on historiography on historical uh, st studies appearing in the 1970s, 1980s. They were under several ideological cliches like Prussian militarism, like Prussian absolutism, like uh, Prussian reactionism. But on the other hand, they started to, to pay more attention to the uh, to such topics like army and the state within within Prussian discourse. Even in Kaliningrad, several works were published. For example, by Viktor Prokopiev, a historian of law and state working at the Faculty of Law in Kaliningrad University, who used to work in Kaliningrad, at Kaliningrad University. So uh, several taboos have fallen down, but still the cliches uh, were to be as kind of ritual. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Большое спасибо. Прошу. Прошу.
thank you so much to, to both of you, because in fact, uh, thanks to um, uh, Dr. Schlepowronski's uh, question, I got some interesting uh, answers too, uh, because as I, I said at the beginning of the discussion, after your presentation, I, I didn't want to, to be the first one to, to use or abuse my position as the organizer, so I wanted other people to, to ask the question first. But one of the questions that I would have been uh, eager to ask you has been uh, already answered, uh, as it was the same question as um, Dr. Slepovronsky, the question how to uh, motivate or legitimize or if I would like to, to make my point once again, but to, to uh, give you an opportunity to, to listen to how I would have formulated it, which is pretty similar, but uh, the question of narratives. And, uh, there was a strong national narrative, for example, in Poland, what uh, Dr. Slepovronski uh, uh, underlined. So uh, as, as you surely know, this um, uh, Piast uh, narrative that it's, uh, anyway, you, you see it already in the in the, the name chosen to call the territories. It's the recovered territories. Yeah? It's not an annexation. It's not something that was given. It's something that you get back from the official uh, Polish uh, narrative after 45. Something that had been um, in the possession of the Germans, uh, in fact, for many centuries, for some of the ter territories at least not for all, and uh, the narrative is to show that it was not legitimate, and what is legitimate is to go back to some roots, the roots that are considered by, by the Piast narratives are medieval roots, but you can find also some antique roots from uh, pre-Slavic times. So uh, the narrative is that there is a legitimacy, that uh, Poland has a legitimate rights to these territories, and uh, the, this right is to recover them. That's the name. And and in fact, well, uh, as for the Kaliningrad Oblast, for uh, this part of Eastern Prussia, the northern part of Eastern Prussia that would not go to Poland, so not Mazura and so on. So there was not nothing like that. The, the only thing would be, well, uh, to legitimate with some kind of uh, uh, old Prussian discourse, this, this uh, Baltic nation that was erased, in fact, by Christianization by the, the, the Teutonic Knights and so on, but it's nothing Russian, nothing, nothing Slavic. In fact, nothing that a Slavic uh, identity would have been able to build upon to legitimate the annexation, to legitimate the fact that now this is Russia, or of course not Russia, that is abused, and now this is the Soviet Republic. For example. So, uh, as you have showed it, uh, it was much more about showing that. Uh, the Prussian heritage had to be erased because it was one of the main reasons for the Second World War, the responsibility. It was a form of, well, uh, let's say, a punishment for past crimes, something more in this category than a kind of a, a national or identity uh, narrative, I, I assume, to, to get back to some roots. Thank you very much for your comments, uh, Dr. Weber. And uh, of course, uh, if we take a look on discussion on uh, the roots, of course, you're right when you state when it was some kind of a punishment for previous, uh, for previous crimes or previous uh, wars or previous aggression. Uh, of course, it was also to uh, demonstrate the, uh, it, of course, the Soviet course had a, uh, um several major elements so the first one and i guess one of the most important was the supremacy of the soviet soviet commun or commun and communist uh, political system soviet and uh, the soviet military over the prussian heritage so the so recognizing the uh lost side as the um, uh, recognizing the lost side as the one which was to be erased uh, as a punishment. Uh, the second one was, of course, uh, uh, was of course the anti-Teutonic or anti-Prussian discourse in general, uh, which was uh, quite common for Soviet historiography, historiography earlier. Uh, of course, uh, presenting the Teutonic Knights as the um, uh, Teutonic Knights as the genocide, uh, as the as the as those who are responsible for genocide. 
you know, of, of the Baltic peoples. Uh, uh, of course, uh, presenting the Prussian state as a, a core of the reaction, as a core of the aggression in Europe and in, in Europe, in Germany, etc. Of course, uh, putting some kind of a blind spot on the um, tight cooperation and uh, tight contacts between uh, Prussia and the uh, Russian Empire, later German Empire and Russian Empire as well. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the third one, of, as you have underlined, was uh, to um, build up uh, some kind of uh, uh, build up some kind of a new identity. But the problem was that the vast part of the new population, the very vast, uh, of course, all of them were uh, some kind of immigrants. Some kind of, there was also some kind of colonial paradigm in there. So stating this area as some kind of a colony for the Soviets, uh, for the Soviet state as well. So these all three parts could be traced in there. Thank you. I hope I um, I hope I managed to give a more uh, to give a relevant reply to your comment. Yeah, yes, totally, totally. Um, th thank you very much. Uh, just to make sure, I have a look uh, at the list. I cannot see any other uh, will to comment or ask some question from the side of our panelists uh, and uh, not either in the chat window from our audience. So I assume that uh, I will not abuse my position if I say right now that uh, we thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ragozin, for your presentation. That is uh, truly goes to the topic of the whole uh, conference and uh, which is also interesting uh, in relation with uh, other presentations we have had or we will have in the uh